Welcome to the last GIS tutorial using spatial data to make economic decisions. And in this tutorial, what I'm hoping you will um, see is that we can extract some spatial information and some information from other sources and combine that information to try and make some economic decisions around a typical cropping pasture scenario. And most of these decisions um, aren't as flexible as, as you might um, see later in this, in this particular tutorial because we typically make our decisions early about how much area we're going to put under crop and how much area we're going to put under pasture and that comes from a range of decisions, how many animals we want to particularly run on our farm and handle and that's linked back to you know, our labour force and the ability to handle those particular animals versus our infrastructure in terms of equipment and our ability to, to crop particular land. So there's a, there's a bunch of management decisions that typically um, decide the shape of our, our enterprise before we actually start making some of these economic decisions. That said, we, once we've got that, that, um, that enterprise established, we can certainly use some of this data to help us make better economic decisions. So hopefully this tutorial will, will give you some insight into how you can use some of those data. So if you haven't opened QGIS um, already, uh, go and open your QGIS and open your previous tutorial, whether you've done it in the format that I've done it where it's all in one or if you separated it out as a separate um, tutorial just for the soils data, go and open that back up because what we essentially want to look at is uh, the clay content of our soils because the, the clay content combined with the amount of water the soils do are two of the main drivers to the productivity of those particular soils. So if we open our QGIS up and we click on our information tool like we did in the previous uh, tutorial and we highlight our clay we should get some information about the uh, raster values for each individual pixel and therefore the clay content of each of these individual pixels. So if I click on the pixel you can see that the values over here are changing as I scroll around and you can see I'm getting values sort of 37, 36, 36, I'll go to a darker one, 33, 37, 37, darker one, 29, and so, you know, my gut feeling for this image data set, if I was to scroll around, would be that I'm probably going to be in the range greater than 35% clay. And that's useful because um, as part of our tutorial, that's one of the criteria that we've sourced some information for you so that you can, you can see um, how we can do some gross um, margin uh, calculations. So if you uh, flick to your second page of your tutorial, it'll ask you what your average rainfall is for our paddock location. So again, if we go back to our BOM site, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology site, and have a look at our Wagga Wagga Ag Institute's uh, average rainfall data, we can see that we fall in the five to 600 millimeter a year um, rainfall and we're right on the edge of the 600 to 700 millimetres. So I would say that our average rainfall is probably going to be somewhere in the vicinity of the 600 millimetre uh, um, per year rainfall. And uh, if we then use that data together, we can go and collect some information about what our production units might produce for our pasture and cropping enterprises. So if you look at table one that's been provided in your tutorial uh, manual, you can see, and that reflects the same as what I've put in here into Excel, so I've actually just typed those values that are, that are on page two of your tutorial into Excel, and you can see that for our cropping enterprises, uh, under a 600 mil, 500 to 650 mil uh, rainfall, annual average rainfall, with uh, soils that have greater than 35% clay, we'll be returning about 5 ton per hectare of wheat and about 3.4 tonnes per hectare of, of canola and 2.2 tonnes 
of per hectare of, of lupin. So you can see that we're able to calculate um, some gross income, some uh, cost of production, some income per hectare and gross margins per hectare. And we'll take you through how we do those calculations um, next. So in, in your um, tutorial guide, you can look at table two. This is some economic data that we've been provided, which gives us the gross income and cost of production for each of these particular enterprises. Now, the first thing I wanted to point out is that that gross income is really dependent on pricing. And you can see here that I've highlighted in yellow that we've got some prices for wheat, canola, and lupins. Wheat tends to be fairly stable and probably around that dollar value most of the time. Canola and lupins can vary quite considerably. For this particular year and this particular data, we've got quite good prices for canola and not such good prices for lupins. If we were to look at current data, you'd probably find that lupins are, are much closer to the $500 mark and that would obviously make some big differences to your gross margin calculations. And so, depending on those prices, we have to do those gross margin calculations every year and often we don't know what the prices are so we're predicting what the price might be based on uh, conditions uh, that might be coming. So there's a whole range of things that we have to consider but we can still go ahead and make some gross margin calculations um, both after the crops have been sold but also prior to give us sort of an estimate of what we might be dealing with to decide on what we might want to plant and uh, where we might want to plant that. So to calculate our gross income, we simply, if I click on this cell here, you can see that I've done the calculations for you, but we simply multiply our, our, um, our price or our gross income times the tonnes per hectare that we're getting here. So we're getting about 200 tonnes per, 200 dollars and we're producing about five tons per hectare. So I can simply uh, multiply those two cells together. So in this case, um, we're taking F11 times J12, and um, we can see that we end up with a value of around $1,000 um, per hectare for wheat. Likewise, we can um, also calculate the same thing for canola and the same thing for wheat. Now, in Excel, if you're not used to the function, all you can do is once you've calculated one calculation, you can just drag those calculations down and it'll recalculate for the other fields if you're not familiar with that particular process. To calculate the gross margin, so if I click on the gross margin cell, you can see I've done the calculation as well. And this is also provided to you in uh, table three, but I thought it might be worthwhile to show you the actual calculations. We basically times our income per hectare, so uh, this particular cell here, you can see that's highlighted, times, uh, and we subtract that from our cost of production, and that gives us a value. So in this case, we've got a value of $634.50 for income for Lucen, and it's costing us $80 a hectare, so our gross margin is $554 per hectare. Now, our gross margins um, tend to be reasonably stable in terms of our pasture enterprises because we tend to get the same inputs going into the crop to keep it going. Maybe in later years of that crop we might try and boost it by putting more fertiliser and our cost of production might, might go up. But in a, in a pasture system what we don't really take into account is the establishment costs and obviously we've we've taken into account our livestock requirements when we've decided on how much how much of our land we're going to put into pasture but we don't take it into account how much it's going to cost to establish that pasture so even though you can see that there's there's very large differences in in return in terms of your gross margin returns between native pasture and some of these other ones that we've planted uh, what they don't show you is is the amount of time that it's going to take you to uh, regain those establishment costs and and so you you have to think in your management system what other risks might I have so when we think of loosen we're probably going to get six to seven years out of uh, our loosen crop 
Um, that's if, if everything goes well, um, we don't get too much disease through the lucerne or weeds taking over, but by about the six or seven year mark, we aren't getting much lucerne coming back. So we need to make sure that our return is, um, is going to occur sort of in that three or four year period and we're going to be making more money off our, our lucerne towards the end. Um, that, and that first few years is sort of covering our establishment costs. And, and obviously there's, there's risk associated with that, particularly when you choose uh, pasture enterprises like Phalaris. Uh, Phalaris will be less drought tolerant than lucerne and definitely less drought tolerant than probably native pasture. So even though we're, we're, we're not um, having any establishment costs for native pasture because we're using what's there, we're still getting a reasonable return that might outweigh the cost of establishing Phalaris, particularly if we were to get a drought condition that knocked our Phalaris completely out. We might actually lose money, even though the gross margin for that particular year looks good, we might lose money overall. So again, just things to be aware of when you're looking at some of these numbers and why we do gross margin calculations on a yearly basis, particularly for our cropping because our prices change but also remembering to consider your establishment costs when you're, when you're dealing with pasture enterprises because even though you're getting uh, a greater gro gross margin per hectare, you've got establishment costs that, can, that need to be made back to make your system profitable. And likewise in your cropping enterprise, we've got that variability um, in our gross margin primarily developed by our, our price but we've also got some other decisions that we need to think. We're typically rotating our crops, trying to keep our, our soil healthy. So, you know, we might rotate um, from wheat or canola back to lupins to get some nitrogen back in the soil because that'll help our wheat and canola. We might rotate between wheat and canola um, and use those as disease breaks. Um, so, you know, that's the, the whole rotation system also has to be considered not just the gross margin value but obviously the gross margin value linked to price is also a, a, a driver and underlying all of that rainfall to, um, to, to get these things to grow plus your inputs but your inputs will likely be uh, or your cost of production will likely be uh, very similar unless there's fluctuations in the cost of fertilizers etc. So one of the questions we might ask ourselves is how do we know which is the best enterprise to choose for each paddock? And I guess the big thing here is that we're unlikely because of our, our business enterprise to change our pasture systems to cropping systems and our cropping systems back to pasture systems. There may be a need every now and then to do that, so we might like to take some of our pasture and re-crop it. Um, and likewise, we might uh, change some of our cropping back to pasture. but. It, it's not something that's going to happen very regularly. Once we've decided on our, um, our livestock and the carrying capacity of our land and we've made a decision of what areas are going to be under pasture and what areas are going to be under crop, there's a, a huge financial cost to changing all of that. So we tend to leave those alone. We tend to crop the areas and rotate those areas and we tend to, to either uh, use native pasture or sow pasture in the other areas. Uh, and so the next set of tests that we're going to um, use to see which paddock uh, wh or what crop we might put in which paddock um, won't really make a lot of sense if we were going to try and change from pasture to cropping because you, in reality you probably wouldn't do that. But in saying that, if we wanted to test if there was a significant difference in income between any of the enterprises we could use the least significant different statistics test um, and you can see here I've done some of those calculations for you on the right so that you can see the result. You're asked to do them and I suggest you actually have a crack at doing them. It's, it's not a very difficult exercise and again I'll try and show you the actual calculations as we go. But essentially what we're doing is we're subtracting um, the gross margins from each other. So you can see here if I was to look at uh, lucerne versus pasture. You can see here that um, the formula I've applied is uh, again the equal sign to get a result. P6, so the gross margin for lucerne minus the gross margin for uh, Phalaris will give me uh, the least 
uh, a significant difference score of a value of 75. And you can see that I've done that same calculation all the way down for different combinations of our pasture and cropping enterprises um, and produce some values. When we look at these values, you can see that some are positive or negative. You can, you can ignore the positive or negative and just concentrate on the magnitude of the score. And um, the result of which is, and this, so essentially what we're trying to calculate is are they statistically the same or statistically different? And essentially if the value that you get for your LSD is less than the gross margin LSD of 146 that's provided here, then they're considered statistically the same. If it's higher than the gross margin LSD, then they're considered statistically different. So if I look at between um, this value here of 75 between Lucent and Phalaris, they're considered statistically the same. If I look at between Phalaris and the native pastures, you can see that that value is larger than the 146, so they're statistically different. And likewise, if I look at the difference between Lucent and native pasture, you can see that they're statistically different because 402 is greater than 146 and so on and so forth. I've highlighted the ones that are the same and the ones that are different. So you can go down and do these same calculations and as I said, ignore the negative values, just look at the magnitude of the score. Um, it, the negative value comes from because I've subject, subjected the smaller one from the bigger one, but if I reversed it, it would be exactly the same value but positive. So as I said before, if we compare this is the pasture system, we can see that um, in both these cases here, when, when, they were when they were statistically the same, we would probably choose Lucen simply because Lucen is returning uh, more than Phalaris, 554 versus 479. Even though they're statistically the same, we'd probably edge on the side of Lucen. Now, there's a number of arguments you could make. You could say, well, look, uh, it, we're in a drought-sensitive area. Um, Lucent's also more likely to be drought-tolerant than Phalaris, so again, that might be a useful decision to go with Lucent. Uh, Lucent might require less input costs um, than Phalaris to keep it going. So again, you might think along those lines. Um, but coming back to what I've already said earlier, you, you might think that, well, hang on a second, it's going to cost me a fair bit of money. It's going to cost me, um, you know, thousands of dollars to establish the Lucent or Phalaris, and it's going to take me three or four years to, to get that money back. I might just stick with the native pasture, even though they are, they are, there is statistical difference and you can see you're making a, a greater gross margin. You have to be practical in your management decision, but certainly from the statistics, we would choose Lucen. And if we were to compare Phalaris and native pasture, you can obviously see Phalaris is, is going to be a return, but we're not considering those establishment costs, so we, we do have to take that into account as well. Now, if we move over into our cropping enterprises, we can see again um, that our gross margins are really being driven by the, the price per tonne that we're getting for our wheat, canola and lupins. And so it's pretty critical. And you can see here that when we do a comparison between wheat and canola, we get a statistically different um, return. And therefore, you know, if we were to look at the prices between those two, we'd probably likely choose canola in all situations. If we only could choose between wheat and lupins, if we had no choice but we had to plant wheat and lupins, well, in that case, we would choose wheat, but I would suggest that in any cropping rotation that we would be starting our cropping off with canola to make the most dollars back. Likewise, if we look at these bottom um, three calculations or three sets of calculations that I've done here, so taking our, our system out of pasture and going to cropping from loosen to wheat, or loosen to canola, or loosen to lupins, you can see that pretty much all of these uh, scenarios, are, they're, they're not very likely because we're not really going to probably do that. But if we were, 
again, the price driver would drive the choice that we would make. And again, you can see what's standing out here is that because we're getting a very good uh, return for canola in this particular year, we would probably, if we were going to take any pasture out and turn it into cropping land, we would probably, in the first instance, put canola in it. So again, I'm hoping you can see that um, there's a lot more to the decision-making process, but I'm also hoping you can see that by doing these simple calculations, by extracting some spatial data and spatial information, here we've only looked at, at clay and uh, percentage clay and rainfall, but there's a whole heap of other information you might be wanting to look at. You could look at things like your yields and your yield variability across your land to try and also help um, uh, make some of these decisions. You might be going back and getting some seed data and, and linking that back to uh, potential yield, etc, etc. So there's a bunch of spatial information you can pull in to try and um, enhance your decision making process. And, and while this tutorial is quite short, I'm hoping that you've been able to see how we can use it. So hopefully that gives you a bit of context to, to why we're using some of these tools and and gives you the ability to use some of these tools and certainly as the course proceeds you'll be trying to digitize your own farms or trying to digitize um, and put some of this information into your own farms to make um, better management decisions in some of, particularly in some of the business management subjects um, but in, also in some of the BSc subjects.